What's wrong with him, they say. He's laughing before we even get started. The reason I'm laughing is my wife is back behind the camera making funny gestures and doing silly things. Good day. It's good to be with you. It's, it's always great to be, have an opportunity to study the Word of God. And today we're going to be studying uh, what we just shows on the screen there, the implications of being justified, okay? The implications of being justified. But if you remember, last week we didn't finish. Last week we talked about Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 25, and I give you guys a little bit of an exercise. I said take the first 15 verses and answer certain questions, okay? Now I'm going to give you just a moment to get yourself a pencil and paper and so that you can take notes and be ready to uh, do something meaningful, okay? Before we get started, I'm going to do what my wife does, which is the right thing to do, and that's pray. Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to talk about your Word. Lord, your Word is precious. I ask you, Lord, to help me to do a very good job. And I ask those who hear me, Lord, to give them spiritual understanding. Open their, their eyes and their spiritual ears and help them to understand and rejoice in what the Word of God says. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to put on uh, up the answers to those questions, okay? Now, I just wrote down the verses real quick. I, at the, across the top, I'm not sure you could read it well. It's... It says, last week's self-study, Romans 4, 1 through 25, answers, okay? The first question was, what verses prove that righteousness is imputed and comes from faith and not the law, okay? The answer to that was found in the verses that are listed there. Uh, verse 3 is the first one. It says, uh, what, <clears throat> for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or accounted to him for righteousness, okay? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, okay? Next verse that I believe gives us a little extra insight was just something that was added onto what was just said, and it's found in Romans 4, 7, and 8. It says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Uh, actually, that wasn't a complete answer to what was said. It just was an explanation of, of uh, what was said in verse 2. And that is that a person who has faith in God or puts his trust in God for righteousness is like the person that David spoke of here in verses 7 and 8. Now, verse 9 says this, Does this blessedness come upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham for righteousness. So it repeats again that faith brings righteousness. Okay, faith in Christ. All right. Now, the, the next question is, and I, I also, you can read verses 23 and 24. And that also substantiates what we said, but those weren't the first 15 verses. I just added those on. Second question, why was a circumcision given to Abraham? That's found in verse 11. It says that, and he, talking about Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. Okay? So Abraham was given that circumcision in order to show his righteousness, that, that he, God gave that to him as a sign. Okay, next question. Uh, who did Abraham become father of? All right, verses 11 and 12. Now, I just read the first part of that. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. And here's the answer, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Okay, And verse 12 adds additional information to that. Fourth question, what benefit does 
goes to the uh, Abraham's children. Okay, what benefit? And the answer is the promise that was made to Abraham that he would be heirs of uh, an, uh, that Abraham would be heir of the world is part of our inheritance. Okay, um, let me see here. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be, be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And, he, and, and we are included in that. And then the last thing, it says, what happens if those who are of the law are also heirs of the promise? Okay, and, and verse 14 says that this, for if those who are of the law, talking about people who try to earn their righteousness by their good works, if those who are of the law are heirs, Paul says, faith is made void and the promise of no effect. Okay, so that's the answer to that. Now, so those are the questions. I really hope that you guys will participate in some of the, the exercises I give you. And here's the reason why. Because if I were to carefully cover a chapter and a half sometimes, it, we couldn't get it done in an hour, hour and a half. And in many cases, the, the, the meat of the subject is in the first portion or a, a, a portion that isn't necessary to cover later. So I just want to... Uh, ask you please to work with me and if I give you an assignment I hope that you will take it to heart and and get involved okay next question back to the subject that we had whoop I'm getting the carried away here the implications of being righteous or being justified if you're not open to Romans 5 would you please open there open to Romans chapter 5 and we're going to start. Now, let's see. You can read that. Uh, why am I questioning that? Well, guys, let me give, just give you a little bit of insight here. <laughs> My camera's in front of me, and doing what I'm doing is not natural to me. You tend to want to talk to a person in the room rather than the camera. So my wife is sitting right across from me here. Sometimes she would sit over to one side or, or the other, and... <clears throat> I find that if I set my little laptop computer right in front of me on a special tripod and I look at my computer, I'm also looking at this camera at the same time. So uh, it helps me stay focused where I'm supposed to. The only trouble is that my little computer screen is much smaller than that one. But having it there in most cases prevents me from having to turn and look at the screen to see if I'm where I'm supposed to be. All right, here we go. Romans lesson five, the implications of being justified. Romans one through five, okay? Here's what Paul says in the first verse. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> Remembering what justification was all about from last week, we said last week that God provided the righteousness that we needed because we didn't have righteousness, so God provided it. He did it by sending Jesus to the cross, and when Jesus shed His blood on the cross, He paid for our sins and removed them. And not only did He pay for our sins, but he paid for the sins for all throughout history. And that means not just what occurred before the cross, during the time of, of uh, from the very first person, but in every sin that occurred afterwards. So Jesus has, is, is not only gonna pay for the sins, or did not only pay for the sins that occurred previously, but his sacrifice paid for the sins that will occur. That's quite a sacrifice. And that sacrifice 
gave that justification, that thing that removed our sins, gave us the privilege of having peace with God. Now, I was thinking about illustrating this, and I was thinking about a courtroom setting. Now, I've, I've not had a lot of trouble with the law. I've had a, some traffic tickets and things like that. I've been in, on jury duty. But someone who's been, let's say there's a, that a person is a real criminal. They're, let's say they're a burglar. And so the, the, the law investigates the crimes of, of burglary of a certain individual, and they find that this person has committed 10 burglaries. And they can identify them from various means, fingerprints, eyewitnesses, and so forth. They gather all the information they can about that person, and they charge him with a crime, and he ends up in court. Well, when he goes to court, they don't just say, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, actually the way that I remember it working, it, it's like this. They have a courtroom scene, it's very formal. The uh, judge reads the charges. The state of California ju uh, against Tom Jones. He's charged with these crimes and they name them. They don't say he was just a burglar. They say on and about this date, he did this, he did that, he did. Now, can you imagine 10 charges of burglary, each burglary let's say, carries a sin. I don't know what it really does, but let's just assume that it carries five years, okay? So he, and he's committed 10 burglaries. If he's convicted of all 10, he'll get 50 years if the judge wants to give it to him. He may make it less, but uh, it all depends on whether he gets mercy or not. But just imagine how many sins you and I and all the other humans on earth have committed and God's going to remember every single one of those sins if Jesus hasn't dealt with them, if he hasn't paid for your sins. So justification is a, is a marvelous thing, okay? And there are benefits that come with being justified. And the first benefit that comes with being justified is having peace with God. And I tried to uh, do this in a way where uh, I, I listed things in, a, in an outline and gave you a, a Roman numerals and letters and so forth to go with each item in my outline. The trouble is it's too hard to get it all on one page. So it's broken down here, and you guys are going to have to try to follow me. Point number A, point number one, is being justified as benefits. And then point A says we have peace with God. Now, before we were justified, we did not have peace with God. In fact, we were like Adam and Eve. We were trying to avoid God. Remember when they sinned? God had to go looking for them. Where are you? Well, I hid myself. Well, why? Why? Well, we as Christians don't have to hide from God, all right, because God is for us. God has, has paid for our sins. We have peace with God. Before we were enemies, the Word of God declares that we were enemies. In Colossians 1.21, it says, And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now... Hath he reconciled? God is no longer my enemy. How many people go around, and, and I'm talking about Christians, feeling some sort of a dread of, this, of God because they don't recognize that they have been justified. Now, <clears throat> I have felt this way myself as a young Christian, and, and as I got older, I didn't fully understand what justification meant. I didn't realize how lasting, how enduring, and how complete it was. But once Jesus justifies you, it stays with you, okay? We have peace with God. Now, there's two kinds of peace, okay? There's a peace with God, and there's the peace of God. You can't get those two confused, all right? The peace with God is what I just described. 
It's the, it's the result of being reconciled to God because he justified us by paying for our sins and removing every one of those sins that was listed, those crimes against God that was listed in our charges. He removed them. Now we have peace with God, but the peace of God is an entirely different thing. Okay, let me uh, go on to that. Peace with God results from justification, like I just said, and by it, God reconciled us to himself. I'm talking about justification. In order, to have, in order for us to have peace with God, we must continue to be justified. Now, that's not something that you have to do yourself, all right? That was done at the cross. Jesus brought justification for your sins. He's already provided it. Let me turn to Romans, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 10, 14, and read to you what it says. It says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And last week I read this same verse, or last time I taught on Romans, I read the same verse to you. And I pointed out that there are two separate things that are mentioned here. He said, uh, for by one offering he has perfected forever, all right, those who are being sanctified. So not, it, it deals with the past and it deals with the future. It deals with the fact that God is at work in you, bringing you to become the man that God wants you to be. It does not mean that you can ignore sin. It does not mean that you can act as if it just simply doesn't matter because he's told us when we sin to, to come to him. But that's something that I want to repeat over and over again to you, and that is this. When you sin, instead of running from God, run to God, because he's the one that takes the sin away. All right. Now, I want to ask you to, to uh, remember David's statement, the statement about David. First, I want to say this. God's not keeping a record. Point number three here. He's not keeping a record of my failures since I'm no longer under the law. My sins are imputed, are not imputed rather. They're, they're not counted, okay? And it, in Romans 4, 7, and 8, we read just a little earlier, it says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. That's from the NIV Bible. I really like the way it says that. All of the, if you look in, in, New, in King James and you look in New King James and you look in the American Standard, all of them say something similar. But <clears throat> I like the way that it says it here. It says, the Lord will never count them against them against them, okay, sins. Now, the peace of God is a different thing, okay? It's that spiritual contentment which gives us, gives rest to our souls. If we lose the peace of God, we haven't lost our salvation. In fact, uh, I think it, it's pretty easy to say that a lot of Christians don't have any peace, okay? And there may be a variety of reasons for it, but there's two basic reasons why people don't have peace. And that, and remember, the peace of God is what makes the peace, excuse me, the peace with God is what makes the peace of God possible. Uh, so if you lose the peace of God, there's a couple of things you may have done or may be doing that is causing that. First of all, you may not be uh, I lose my, lose my mental focus once in a while. If you lose the peace of God, you may have sinned and your conscience is maybe troubling you. You feel alienated again from God. It doesn't mean that God has removed 
his justification, it means that you feel like he has, okay? And you've got to do something about that. When you feel that you've lost the peace of God and you know it's because you've done something you shouldn't have done, you need to go to him and like 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sins to, to the Lord and, and he will forgive you and the blood of Christ will forgive you for every sin, will cleanse you from every sin. So that's one reason. And the other reason is this, and that is that a lot of times we do this. The Bible says, cast all your care upon him. It says again, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And that says that in Philippians chapter four. And it says in verse seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus. Wow. Now, folks, the trouble with us is we don't act upon that. Instead of casting all our care upon him and putting our trust in him for everything we do, we are focused on accomplishing it ourselves. We're focused on carrying the burden. We don't cast our care upon him. So that's, I gave those two reasons. There are some places that may say there are more, but I think they fall basically into a couple of categories. But anyway, those are two reasons. All right, let me find where I'm at. I got my notes here. Now, let me go on. It says in verse number two, through whom, talking about Jesus, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's look at that again. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, okay? Now, I've got two points listed under that, and that is, first of all, we're living in God's grace. That means every day as I walk and live my life, I'm living in the favor of God. Look at the, the red letters I wrote down there. I, uh, I, liked, I don't know that I have to explain them, but I'm going to say this. You see, a lot of times I will write something in red simply to contrast it from the rest of things and to cause you to focus on that. And I put down there, God's grace it is his divine favor and can be given in a multitude of ways. And I remember in 1 Corinthians, uh, actually, I can't remember whether it's in first or second, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about giving. And he said to them, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. There's no limit to God's grace. And you and I are walking and living every moment of our life in God's grace. When you say, well, it sure doesn't feel like it. I, don't have a, I, have, I didn't have a very good week last week. Everything went wrong. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. But the fact is, you have peace with God. And because you have peace with God, God has given you access into his grace. So two things, we're living in God's grace and then we have access to more grace. I can't help but, re but always remember the apostle Paul when he prayed to God to take away his thorn in the flesh. Now, would you please focus with me and think for a second on the life that the apostle Paul lived everywhere the man went, he had some sort of problem it seemed. He was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was arrested, he was jailed, on and on. People opposed him, people hated him. The, the, the Jewish people considered him a, a false prophet. They, they just did everything imaginable to him. Now here's a guy, if you follow the logic of today's world, you would, someone would say, well, boy, it sure seems like he wasn't in the will of God. If he was in the will of God, he wouldn't have had all those problems. And yet in the very beginning of Paul's experience, 
when Ananias was told to go pray for him, he said, I, God said to Ananias, I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Folks, sometimes suffering is connected with our Christian experience. I don't care what your favorite television person says, okay? All right. Peace with God causes rejoicing. Let me re, uh, get on down to that. It says in verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, okay? Knowing that tribulation, I'll, I'll stop right there. We glory in tribulations. What are tribulations? Tribulations are trouble, okay? Uh, James calls them trials, okay? And, and glorying in them is not something we think of as fun, okay? I don't want to have a trial. And you remember when Jesus prayed, he said to the, the Father, this is how you pray to the Father. He said, Lord, lead us not into temptation. He was talking about trials, okay? Lord, don't lead me in a path that comes to trial. Does that mean that we will always be able to avoid it? Not at all, okay? James said this in, in James uh, chapter 1, verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Oh, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I have, I'm, I'm not saying the word of God is not accurate. It's not telling me that it is all joy. He's telling me to count it all joy. So when I face various trials, count it joy. Well, what's a, what's a trial? It may be that you have to work in a job that you don't like. You get up every morning and you go to work and you're working with people who oppose you. You're working with a person who's unpleasant. Uh, he disagree. He's not, not very agreeable. He's always challenging everything you do. Maybe you're the supervisor and he's your thorn in the flesh. <laughs> and every day that man or woman makes your life hard. It, it's just all sorts of ways that trials can come to you, okay? It could come in the form of sickness. Now, does God bring that sickness on you? No, he doesn't. God doesn't give bad things away, but he, does, he has the power to stop them, and he doesn't stop them sometimes, okay? If you think about Job, the devil couldn't do anything to Job until he got permission, okay? So God uses it. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what that means, okay? What do trials mean? Count it all joy when you fall into various uh, kinds of trials, all right? And I'll repeat what it, it says here through whom we have access by faith, no, verse 3 rather, and not only that, we also count, we glory in tribulations, okay? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and so forth. I'm going to read that in a second. But we recognize the reason that we are able to count it all joy is because we recognize it produces a, a good result in us, okay? Verse 3. Now, God uses suffering as discipline. Now, if you're like me, when someone says discipline, the first thing I think of is corporal punishment, okay? I think of a spanking. Not everything that God does to you or allows to happen to you is a spanking. Sometimes discipline is rather training or teaching, all right? So when you get into a trial at your work or anywhere, that trial is, is going to teach you something. It's going to change you in some way. And if you read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, I forgot to move, a, move forward in my notes. 12, 7 says this, Endure hardship as discipline. Okay, that's the very first part of Hebrews 12, 7. I believe it's in the NIV. You endure hardship as discipline or endure hardship as training or teaching. Okay, God is using something to shape your character. Now, what does that prove? Well, God's, when God uh, uses suffering as discipline, he is proving 
that you are his child, okay? <laughs> it says this. Uh, I should have actually read the whole thing here in a different, uh, verse 7, in, in a different way. So I'm going to go back and catch it here. 12, 7. So if you'll be patient with me. All right, verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. That's the New King James. For what son is there whom a father doesn't chasten? Okay. In the NIV, it says, God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Now, I was, my wife and I were laughing and thinking uh, uh, before we started this teaching about our children, especially my daughter. My daughter, we had rules that they had to live by, and my daughter often felt they were unfair. And she would say, that her friends could all do what we weren't permitting her to do. Why would we do that? That's not fair. Or as, as my, my son might have asked, why am I getting a spanking for doing something my neighbor child does and you're spanking me and he doesn't get a spanking? Well, first of all, I can't spank my neighbor's children. They're not my responsibility. But the fact that I'm getting a spanking proves that I belong. And my daughter used to say, her, one of her favorite sayings was, and I can't say it, I wish I could repeat it. I, it would be so much fun to have it recorded. She used to say, Dad, that's so unfair. And she had such a lilting way of saying it. And she said it to me and she said it to her mother. And her mother would always say, I know and I don't care. <laughs> But anyway, God spanks you or God trains you because you are his child. Romans 12, 8. And then the, the, in Romans 12, 11, excuse me, Hebrews 12, 11, it says, No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, the reason God uses suffering in our life is to train, uh, to train us, to help us to become more Christ-like, to develop His character in us, okay? Now, Paul names three things in this chapter to support what he said. He says... Suffering produces endurance, okay? If you read in, in the, I, I didn't go back to get these verses, but I think I can speak accurately. In the King James Version, sometimes it calls uh, endurance long suffering. Some versions in, in other places may use the word patience, okay? We're talk, not talking about a, a physical uh, ability to endure or strength, but we're talking about a spiritual development, an emotional and character that goes with it. And I was, I was thinking about my knee replacement surgery. After the surgery, one of the very first things they started to do was give me physical therapy. And so the, when, when I first got started, about the first four, I think, uh, physical therapy appointments my, I had was at my home. And I would, I'd be laying in bed in my pajamas and the, the nurse would come out and Julie and her would stay in the room there and she would cause my, me to do exercises that bent my knee and was designed to keep it flexible or, or help me to gain flexibility in my knee. Then a little later on, they sent me to a physical therapy place and one of the very first things they did was put me on a machine called a flexinator, as I recall. And you sat in a chair and stretched your leg out, put your foot in a stirrup, and they had a little hydraulic device that you pumped, and it would draw your knee back towards you, okay? 
And of course, when you are first there, you, it, it hurts to do that. And you only have a, a certain, so many degrees that you can bend your knee because there's pain connected with it, okay? And so as, they, as I came, the very first appointment, they told me, all right, Mr. Hood, I want you to sit down there and I want you to stand as much pain as you can for two minutes, then you can release the hydraulic valve and, and let your leg stretch back out. And after you've rested it a second or two, pump it back up again and draw your knee back towards you, your foot back towards you, so your knee is bending further and further. Endure it for 20 minutes, or excuse me, two minutes. And they asked me to do that three times every time I came in. The first day I went there, the first two minutes were almost unbearable. I was, about, I was tempted to stop before the two minutes were over because it was hurting really bad but I kept doing it. And by the time I finished my physical therapy, it hurt almost not at all. And I could bend my knee so much further. And every time I would go in and bend, do that exercise, I would leave with my knee feeling much more free and movable and easy to deal with. And so what God is doing is he's using spiritual exercises to give you spiritual therapy. So you will be the kind of person that he wants you to be. That's called sanctification. And God does it. And then he says this. Paul said the next thing that, it, that you'll gain as a result of having endurance is you'll gain character. You'll become more like Christ. How many mature Christians, how many young Christians have had a mature Christian as a role model and a, and a, and a mentor? My wife's, one of my wife's mentors, for, you know, one of my mentors was my wife's grandmother. I love that woman. She was a great lady. I used to go by her house and just visit with her for hours, okay? Character. She had been through a lot in her life, a lot of suffering. And so she had character. And then once you develop character, character produces hope. And I wrote in red there, bright expectation, okay? Instead of feeling hopeless in a, in a trial, you will face that trial and realize that God is on your side. And when God is on your side, what in the world could, could overcome you, okay? So we recognize that suffering brings results, okay? Now, let's move on to the next thing we have to say here. And Paul says this, okay? He says, and hope does not disappoint us. So as we have grown in our Christian experience, we've gotten endurance, we've gotten character, our hope is growing because our faith is growing. Hope does not disappoint us. And, and Paul says this in verse 5, and I have to get back there. That's the trouble with sitting here and turning your Bible to different places. He says in verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, if you don't stop and think about that very much, it, it will kind of go over your head. So I put it a different way. Verse 5, I said, because the Holy Spirit fuels us with God's love. So if the Holy Spirit is, is pouring out God's love in our hearts, our hearts are alive with a relationship that God provides. In other words, God is personal to you. You have a relationship with Him. He means something. He's not just a person you read about. He is real to you. So... The Holy Spirit is at work making the things of God real in your life, making the Word of God come alive, but He can't do it unless you want it and you're willing to cooperate with Him. All right. Now, let me see. I wanted to talk to you in the, about the next six, uh, Romans 5, 6 through 11. 
And in that is contained this, the implications of Christ's death. Okay, so I'm going to go there real quick here and pick up my spot. It says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. If, I believe if you're looking, if you have a New American Standard Version, it doesn't say in due time, it said at the perfect time. Okay, that means at just the right time in history, just the right time in world events, Christ came, okay, and he died for the ungodly. He, <laughs> he didn't die for good people, he died for the bad people, all right? For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But verse 8 but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? So, under the heading of the implications of Christ's death, point two, item A says Christ's death revealed the greatness of God's love. Okay? Christ's death on the cross revealed the greatness of God's love. And every human being alive practically knows John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, he goes on to say this, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Okay? Much more then, having been, now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God but through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So, Christ's sacrifice causes great expectations or hope, okay? If under verse 8, it says, much more having been justified, okay, we shall be saved from wrath. We're talking about work that has already been accomplished, okay? Something that's already been done. You've been removed from under God's wrath. Remember back in, in, in verse 18 of chapter 1, it said that, that the, the wrath of God is revealed, against un the all unrighteousness, okay? So, you've been removed from that. Much more having been justified, you shall be saved from wrath through him. Work accomplished. Second item, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's work continued, okay? That's ongoing. So, instead of walking around feeling like God is opposed to you, get a hold of yourself and grasp what the Word of God says. God, God's Word is for you. If you, if you, you know, we're going to arrive at, at probably my favorite part of Romans, and that's the eighth chapter where he said, there is therefore now no condemnation. Well, right here, I want you to understand something. And that is that God is for you. God is, is you're living in, in God's grace. God's grace is God's unmerited favor. It's, it's his, uh, I wish I had a better, better vocabulary, a bigger vocabulary. God is, is for you in every way. One of my personal problems is that at times I tend to be too critical, you know, I look at something and I find fault with it, okay? I look at a situation and I say, this is what's wrong with that. We got to correct that. And so that leads me to go around being critical of this and critical of that. And so when we're that way, we think of God as being that way. God is not that way. That's how I am. Maybe you're that way. And that may lead us to be critical of other people. We shouldn't do that. You know what God's like? God sits back and lets you do what you want to do. 
and eventually he may be forced to correct you. But God is not looking, going around looking for something to blame you for. If you know, in the in the Bible it says, "Fathers, uh, be patient with your children." He says that if you're harsh with your children, you will discourage them. God is not harsh with you. He doesn't want you to be discouraged. He wants you to have a bright hope and expectation where He is concerned. My Father is for me. If He doesn't give me what I want, it's because He knows it's not good for me. Uh, God is, is gracious, folks. There's just nothing, no one like the Lord. All right. Where am I at? I'm on slide 13. All right. Let me move on. And he goes on to say this. More than that, we now rejoice. And you'll notice in parentheses, I put, well, I put the, the more than that in white and the rejoice in red. And then in parentheses next to it, I said boast slash glory in Christ. And I'm not going to do it. I had thought to, but I said see Strong's there in parentheses. I'm not sure you can, yeah, you probably can read it. Strong's Concordance, whenever I'm, I have a hard time or I want a bigger picture, sometimes I'll go to Strong's Concordance in, in the, at a website called Bible Hub, and they will take a, a, a verse and they will identify every single word in there, and you can look up the meaning of every single word. And if you look up the word rejoice in there, it means to boast or glory not in yourself, but in God. You're so confident now in your relationship with God that you can boast about God. You, are, are, you can brag about Him, okay? You can tell people how good He is. You can tell people what He's done for you. You, you're, you become a witness, okay? Romans 5.11 says this, Not only is this so, but we also boast in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation, NIV Bible. So not only do we feel secure with God, now we feel we can brag about God, okay? All right. That's the last slide I have, and I want you to uh, do something for me, and I want you to... Uh, Take Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, and I want you to read them, and, and uh, I want you to answer a question. The, the, this is point number three in, in our study, and it's, it's headed up as death in Adam and life in Christ. The very first point in it is sin and death came into the world through one man, okay? Okay. We know that was Adam. I want you to compare what it says in Romans 12 and, uh, excuse me, Romans 5, 12 through 20, and I want you to identify the differences between what ha happened, the sin that came into the world as a result of Adam, and the forgiveness and grace that came through Christ. Identify the differences between the two. And so I'm going to sit down next week, just like we did this week, and hit those points, and uh, we'll, we'll cover it again. And next time we study, we're going to be saying, we're going to be answering a question that I think's probably in the minds of everybody, and that question is what Paul says. I'm going to read it to you. In, in chapter 6, Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What, in other words, is it okay to just go ahead and sin since I'm not under the law? Can I just do whatever? Paul's going to answer that for us next week. Okay, next, actually not next week, week after next, because Julie teaches next week. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's over there going like this. <laughs> anyway, folks, I look forward to it.
I hope you learned something. God bless you and, and keep you is my prayer. Amen. Thanks for watching our Family Life Church YouTube channel. Share this video with a friend and subscribe to our page so you never miss a blessing.